Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I am your fearless leader, Clay Travis. I hope all of you, wherever you may be across this great country, across this great land, are having fantastic Thursdays wherever you may find yourself. And I hope as you get ready to decide on your gambling picks tonight, you will follow me to the promised land. I have had a rough go of it of late, including last night. When I went to Lipscomb University and cursed their entire basketball program and managed to uh, watch them lose to Liberty, which uh, crushed a money line parlay for me. But I want you to listen to me carefully. These four teams pay out over uh, one to one. In other words, if you bet $100, you're going to end up with over $100 on this bet. All right? Are you ready for it? I am really confident about this tonight. Money line parlay. I like Oklahoma City to beat the Pelicans. I like uh, for Gonzaga to beat whoever Gonzaga is playing. I think it's Loyola Marymount tonight. I like for uh, the... uh, uh, Oh, what are my other big plays here? My four-way parlay. I'm going to have to pull it out here. I just made this bet. I just put it out. I'm giving you an early preview on Lock It In. But it's Thursday and it's Valentine's Day and everything is adding up tonight. Uh, I've got Belmont over Tennessee State. I've got Gonzaga over Loyola Marymount. The Thunder over the Pelicans. And the Hawks over the Knicks. If you just bet those four teams outright to win, it pays out at more than your bet. In other words, if you bet like $100, you're going to make back like 120 bucks on this. I love this bet tonight. It's going to win me the week on Lock It In. Again, that four-way money line parlay. Just these teams to win. The Hawks to beat the Knicks, the Thunder to beat the Pelicans, Gonzaga over Loyola Marymount, and Belmont over Tennessee State. I love all of these bets. Dive in and grab them. And if you do want to dive in and grab them, you can go to MyBookie. You go to MyBookie.ag right now, provided it's legal in your jurisdiction. You can look into it yourself if you are fascinated by the legalities of sports gambling. Put in... Uh, $100, they'll match it with $50. Put in $1,000, they'll match it with $500. Put in uh, $500, they'll match it with $250 if you use the code CLAY50 or OUTKICK. MyBookie.ag, the presenting sponsor of OUTKICK the show. I appreciate the time and the support for uh, the show that they are showing. MyBookie.ag, CLAY50, OUTKICK is the code. You get a 50% deposit bonus. All right, let's dive right in here. Lots of talk about Joe Flacco to uh, Denver Broncos and the decision by the Baltimore Ravens to basically, it appears, free up everything so that you have a situation where Lamar Jackson is the quarterback of the future. One of the things that I love to do in the world of sports or anything else is when you find something that works, usually the younger guys you're looking for somebody else who resembles them. In other words, I always like to think about things in athletics and also in life in general with the best case scenario and the worst case scenario. And to me, when I break down Joe Flacco, we kind of know what the best case scenario is, right? He could be a top 10 caliber quarterback if everything goes well with him. I don't think there's any doubt. Now he's 30, just turned 35, So in theory, he's got three or four more years of really good performance before all is said and done with Joe Flacco, in theory, at the quarterback position. Now, I'm going to get to Elway's decision in a minute. But more intriguingly, I like to think about what is the overall positivity out there that is hanging around with Lamar Jackson. And in particular, the thing that I would focus on is this question. Who does Lamar Jackson remind you of that has been, and we talked about this on the radio show this morning, that has been a highly successful quarterback at any point in his life? Okay? Who does he remind you of? I don't know at all who a successful quarterback that is like Lamar Jackson has ever existed. To me, Lamar Jackson is Tim Tebow 2.0. He is Vince Young 2.0. He is RG3 2.0. Everything is about finding a model and trying to project this guy in. All three of those guys, Tebow, VY, and RG3, had immediate success 
and then fell apart when defenses actually realized they could stop them from running and that they weren't threats in the passing game. So to me the Ravens are about to go through the Vince Young experience 2.0. I lived this. I bought into the hype. When Vince Young started for the Tennessee Titans and he won in a walk-off 40-yard sprint against the Houston Texans we all thought Vince Young was going to be a game-changing quarterback. The kind of guy that altered forever the trajectory of the quarterback position in the NFL. That was the argument you had to buy into. That was the argument you had to support if you believed in him. Okay? I don't see it at all from Lamar Jackson. Now, if you believe that at some point in time an NFL quarterback is going to arise and he is going to eliminate the existing paradigm that occurs for quarterbacks then maybe you can go out there and argue that Lamar Jackson is going to be a difference maker. Here's the problem with that in general. We haven't seen it in 20 years. We haven't seen it in 25 years. Ultimately the NFL is a quarterback driven league and it's a quarterback driven passing league. You need somebody who can drop back on third and eight when everybody knows that a guy is going to pass and you need somebody who can convert third and eight. And ultimately that has to be a passing quarterback. Tim Tebow couldn't do it enough. Vince Young couldn't do it enough. RG3 couldn't do it enough. And I don't believe that Lamar Jackson will be able to do it enough either. Now, if you want to accept and make the argument that Lamar Jackson is a paradigm shifter that he is a game changer of such epic proportions you can make that argument as well. Okay? You can make the argument that you know what this guy is going to change the way the game is going to be played. Most of the time that doesn't happen and nobody's actually done it in 25 years. Nobody has ever evolved and changed the way the NFL is played in 25 years. Ultimately it's a passer league. And so unless you want to argue that Lamar Jackson is de novo that there's never been anybody like him before and he is going to be able to change the league forever this is I think a really bad move by the Baltimore Ravens to hand over the franchise to Lamar Jackson. Sometimes there are game-changing unbelievable talents. I'll give you an example. Whether you love or hate LeBron James he is basically Carl Malone's body except with a point guard's ability. When LeBron came into the league he was Carl Malone already almost and certainly he's grown into Carl Malone except with the ability to play point guard. We've never seen anybody with LeBron James's combination of size and ability. Maybe Zion Williamson is going to be the next iteration of this but so far I don't believe yeah somebody said it's Carl Stockton it's a good combination of Carl Malone and John Stockton. Nobody else has had LeBron James's physicality. Some people are dumb. They're like Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson wasn't a great athlete. Magic Johnson was 6'9". He was big and he could handle the basketball. But Magic Johnson could barely jump in comparison to other top athletes. Nobody has ever been like LeBron James. Michael Vick, a lot of people want to make an argument about Michael Vick. I think Michael Vick is a superior version of Lamar Jackson. But Michael Vick won two playoff games in his career never really changed the game at all. Honestly. Maybe if he had put in the same time that other quarterbacks would have in the film room he could have changed the way that the game was played. He didn't do it. And so as a result I don't buy into Lamar Jackson. I would rather have Joe Flacco for the next three years than I would Lamar Jackson. It doesn't mean that I believe Joe Flacco is going to be a tremendous success nor do I believe John Elway has done a good job managing the quarterback situation for the Denver Broncos. When you think about drafting Brock Osweiler when you think about making the decision to go get Paxton Lynch when you think about going to sign Case Keenum other than persuading an already Hall of Fame quarterback in Peyton Manning to sign with the Broncos everything that John Elway has done is a little bit of a disaster. If I were the Ravens and you never see this happen But if I were the Ravens I would draft another quarterback in the first round this year. I think the Broncos probably will draft another quarterback in the first round. I don't know exactly whether I wouldn't trade up but if you got Dwayne Haskins out there if you've got Drew Locke 
If you've got uh, Daniel Jones, a guy from Duke who I'm not an expert on, if you've got Kyler Murray and you may uh, make an opportunity to get there, uh, or uh, potentially Will Greer, I would get another quarterback to back, to back up Lamar Jackson because I think Lamar Jackson's going to be a disaster this year with the NFL defenses having an entire offseason to get ready for him. I think you're going to see a lot of performances like we saw in the by the Chargers in uh, the postseason. And I think Lamar Jackson ultimately is going to fall apart. So we will see what ends up happening there. I like the Bronco move better than I do the Ravens move. I don't like either of these moves. And I don't think either one of these teams is going to be highly successful. But if I had to pick a guy between these two, I'd rather have Joe Flacco as the quarterback of my team for the next three years. I think the Ravens are going to fall apart. I think if you watch these games, and look, I'm a Lamar Jackson guy. I bet a lot on Louisville over the years. I loved watching him play. He's a one-read-and-run guy, and that doesn't work in the NFL. Ultimately, the NFL is all about third-down passing. You have to make Big-time plays when everybody knows you're going to throw. That's what the Chargers were able to do. Sooner or later, they stop you from being able to run. And you have to be able to make big-time throws in big-time situations. The NFL really is a third-down passing league. That's all I need. That's all I need to see when I rate quarterbacks. How do they do on third and long when you have to be able to throw the ball to convert a pass? That's all I care about. All right. Uh, Big story here. The Pac-12 Network. Have you guys been paying attention to this situation, the Pac-12 network is starting to implode. And this is a fascinating story. They projected that each school was going to get between 7 and $10 million off of the Pac-12 network. Instead, last year, they got $2.5 million in year six. Combined, they haven't even made a $10 million total in six years of the Pac-12 network. Here is my thesis. You guys can agree or disagree with it. I think there are two conferences that are big enough to have networks that are lucrative and make money. The SEC and the Big Ten. I think everybody else, Longhorn Network, I think the Big 12 wisely didn't do a network. I think the Pac-12 tried and is failing. And I also think the ACC network is going to fail. Everybody else doesn't have the fan base to be able to pull this off. The SEC network is insanely successful partly because it's being run well as a big business, more because the SEC fans are huge, insane, wild, big-time uh, fans of that, uh, those conferences and those teams. And as a result, they have been able to make a ton of money and everybody else is chasing them. Everybody else is trying to get their own version of the SEC network and the Big Ten network. Now, the Pac-12 network is fascinating because they haven't been able in any way to take care of distribution and also, and this is wild, in general, I'm kind of blown away by the failure. I don't understand exactly what is going on here in general with their attempt to get out and make a play in a big way with the Pac-12 network. Just doesn't make any sense, all right? Crazy, rabid fan base doesn't exist in the Pac-12 and I think it's wild particularly when you consider that Larry Scott is making $4.8 million a year to run this thing. Um, I I think we got major issues going forward. I don't think there's any doubt at all about it. And that's why the Pac-12 is trying to sell out of their brand. All right, a couple of other things. Uh, Matt Kuchar getting crushed for only giving $5,000 to his caddy. Um, I, I think this is an example of a manufactured story. He agreed with the caddy before they started the, the round. It was a rent-a-caddy, basically. And the caddy said, okay, I'll take five grand. And then he ended up, uh, later on, turns into a big story that he only gives him five grand. Now, maybe you can argue that Kuchar should have given him more money. That is probably cheap, but that's what they agreed to beforehand. This is a guy he didn't work with. I think the way this story is being conveyed is this, this is his full-time caddy. This is a guy who is working with him while he is down there. But he did bonus the caddy. He had agreed to only pay him $1,000 a day. He gave him an extra $1,000. I think this is a manufactured story in general. Uh, Because, again, it's a rented caddy. It's not like it's his full-time caddy. It's not like this guy works on him on all the majors and everything else. He agreed to pay him beforehand. But this is just a bad look because they chased down the caddy and now the caddy's saying he wished he had gotten more money 
and everything else. I don't think it makes a lot of sense, but Kuchar, uh, Matt Kuchar, if you're not familiar with him, I think this is an example of a story that's just blown way out of proportion. It's Kuchar's money. If he had given him ten grand, would it be better? Sure. But $1,000 a day with an extra $1,000 when he won the round, we don't actually know how much work the caddy did. That's five times as much as the caddy usually makes in an individual day. I don't think there's a, a, a major issue here. Um, this is, uh, somebody said it's like giving somebody extra money. I, I, I disagree. I don't think there's a lot of story here. I think it is a, uh, I think it's just a manufactured story and I think a lot of people are not actually aware of the details. If you read the details here, again, it's a guy that he rented to work at this tournament who works at the, at the place otherwise. Maybe he gives him an extra $5,000. I don't think it's that big of a deal. All right, finally. Uh, yeah, that's right. This is a big part of the story. He offered the caddy an additional $15,000 and the caddy said no because they had a contract which is actually really honorable of the caddy. I would have taken the extra $15,000 but the report is that he offered him twenty k and he said no, I'll take the five. Um, so I, I don't see anything wrong with it, honestly. Uh, the caddy initially was fine with the money he got then somebody interviewed him and he decided that it was a bigger deal than, uh, than otherwise. I, by the way, am headed to Cancun on Saturday. I may play golf at this same golf resort and I will tip my caddy well. But I don't think Kuchar did anything any, uh, that, that badly. This is an example of where the headline runs out. I wanted to read all about it. I read the quotes from Kuchar and most people are reacting to the headline only uh, and, uh, and I think it's just a, uh, it's just a messy uh, situation. All right? uh, this, is, uh, this is just an ugly, uh, ugly story. My handicap is high. My handicap is golf um, in general. Finally, I've been telling you guys this. I've been telling you guys this for a long time. I think it makes complete sense for Donald Trump to go ahead and declare a national emergency on the border wall so we can stop arguing politically about it and let this move on to 2020. If he declares a national emergency, I told you this solution a month and a half ago or whatever, before the initial uh, shutdown of government happened. Let the court system go out. It will immediately be challenged in law. This is the report that Donald Trump is finally getting around to it and we will find out whether or not he has the authority to do it. If he doesn't have the authority to do it, look, you're talking to a lawyer. It will stay in the courts for the next couple of years. It will be an issue to run on in 2020 and the American public can come out and make a decision about whether or not they want to support Donald Trump and his border wall. Our immigration policy is fundamentally broken. I have said for a long time I am in favor of a ton of immigration but I want it to happen legally. I want America to go draft all of the intellectual draft picks from other countries and bring in the incredibly talented people from other countries to America so they can create jobs, businesses, and opportunity as many immigrants already do. Many Americans, my belief, take our opportunities, our liberty, our freedoms, our economy for granted and certainly they take for granted the opportunity to create a business which allows ownership interest uh, to exist and for huge amounts of money to be made thanks to how wealthy as a country we are. And so I think legal immigration is a really good move. I uh, think that also Ill illegal immigration is a bad move. I don't know that the wall is what we should be fighting over. I think it's overall immigration reform period. And it's actually fascinating if you study any kind of data. For a long time there was discussion as if we were going to have overpopulation issues in the world. If you actually study the data on where population growth is going every major westernized democracy is starting to decline in population with the exception of the United States. Even China which is not a westernized democracy is starting to decline in population. Japan's population is collapsing. Germany, France, England all of these countries are getting older and as a result the only way to up the overall population and fill all these jobs and homes and businesses that we have created is to increase population. And so I think this is a major issue. For a long time we talked about overpopulation 
the big issue the world faces is that population is growing fast in poor countries and slow in rich countries. That's because richer people have fewer children. And so the solution here to take this out of the debates every single month and over the budget and everything else declare an emergency and allow the courts to determine whether or not the president has the executive authority to declare an emergency in this case. It will take years to reach the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will ultimately decide whether this resides within the executive's authority. And if it does, Trump can build his wall. If it doesn't, we'll probably be on to another president. So I think this is a solution. That way you don't have to shut down the government. That way you don't have to create a huge issue. All right? That is uh, my analysis of the immigration debate and a way to solve the issue. And I say that as a guy who's hopping on a plane to go down to Mexico for the next week. I can't wait to hang uh, and be able to uh, to have a week's R&R at the beach down on the Mayan Riviera. All right. I love all of you. I got to go do my television show. I appreciate you guys hanging out here. Be live tomorrow. MyBookie.ag Clay50 or OutKick for a 50% deposit bonus. You will be glad that you did it. Again, MyBookie.ag where it is legal in your jurisdictions. Uh, Consult the law if you see fit. 50% depository bonus if you use the code CLAY50 or OUTKICK. Kisses to everybody. I'll be live tomorrow. I'm just about to be live on uh, on Lock It In. My four-way money line parlay that's going to hit tonight. Love this. Encourage you to hop on it. Get ready. Uh, Hawks over the Knicks. The uh, Tennessee... Uh, sorry, Hawks, sorry. Hawks over the Knicks. Thunder over the Pelicans. Gonzaga over Loyola Marymount. Belmont over Tennessee State. We'll be talking about Tennessee tomorrow. Kisses. Love you. Bye. Love you. Thank you, Facebook. See y'all.